And to think that my friends always ask me if there's enough to talk about in the Linux and open source world. Well, yeah, because this week we've got Fedora dropping X11 out of the default install for Fedora 41. We've got the big part of a lawsuit against GitHub Copilot being dismissed by a judge in California. And we also have some more news about Cosmic. We've got Gnome losing the Gnome Foundation's director, Holly Million, who leaves after less than a year, and a bunch of other things, including this segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Proton. You probably know about them. They make an all-in-one suite of privacy-focused tools for your email, online storage, calendars, contacts, VPN, and passwords. Everything is end-to-end -end and zero access encrypted, and it is designed to make sure that your data stays yours. And Proton just launched a brand new tool for that entire online suite, and that's Proton Docs. If you've ever used Google Docs, you will be right at home here. It is your fully encrypted collaborative online word processor. You can edit a document with other people in real time. You can gather feedback thanks to comments and discussions. You can share these documents securely with full access control. And the best thing is, it's part of your Proton account, even a free account. And it's accessible straight from Proton Drive. As always, you can just click the link in the description below to get started with Proton, create your account, and start moving your life towards a more privacy-respectful solution. So, after GNOME announced that they could now be built without X11 dependencies, it was inevitable Fedora 41 will ship with Wayland only. The install media will not contain X11 support for GNOME, meaning the default install will be Wayland only. For now, X11 support remains in the repos. You will still be able to install it if you are experiencing issues with Wayland. These issues should be lessened significantly because, well, you now have explicit sync support in GNOME and the latest NVIDIA drivers, but there could be some compatibility problems here and there for various applications, so people who need X11 can still get it. And of course, people who are upgrading from Fedora 40 will keep their X11 session installed. It will not be removed in the process. Obviously, at some point, this won't be possible in Fedora anymore. It will be completely impossible to use X11, but you probably have two or three versions still uh, before that happens. Personally, I am all for this deprecation process. Fedora has always been the place to do this kind of stuff. And the more people use Wayland by default, the more bug reports are going to flow in and the better Wayland will get with more users and more things being fixed. And of course, you will always have plenty of other distributions who keep supporting X11 for probably a decade. So yeah, it's not really harming anyone's experience here. Now, on the GNOME side of things, it looks like Holy Million's tenure as the executive director of the GNOME Foundation won't have been a very long one, totaling 10 months. The foundation announced that she would leave with Richard Litauer becoming interim director for the time being. Holly will leave on the 31st of July and she says she's really proud of what she's been able to accomplish, which for such a short time seems to be quite a lot. She made sure that the foundation has a nice plan for the future. She made sure that the books are balanced, that the foundation is not hemorrhaging cash anymore. And she found a bunch of potential funding avenues as well. She will apparently leave to pursue a PhD in psychology and running her own private practice. And judging from the foundation's communique, there doesn't seem to be a further reason than that. The new director, Richard Litauer, apparently has a lot of experience in open source as a contributor and at a few more leadership positions as well. The foundation will start looking for a permanent executive director and they will announce their choice after Guadec. And I am 100% certain that some people in the Linux or open source community will spin that as some kind of drama, as it was inevitable, she wasn't qualified. But from where I stand, Holly leaves the GNOME Foundation in a better place than what she found it on. So I think she did a good job. And hopefully the GNOME Foundation manages to find a new director that can keep writing the ship for maybe a bit longer this time. Now, we also have some news about Cosmic. They apparently only have 20 issues to resolve before the alpha is out. So it is pretty damn close. 
They have a few more features to share as well, notably styling inactive windows with specific colors, so it is more obvious what is currently in focus and what isn't. They also have a settings page to configure keyboard shortcuts, something plenty of people will be very happy about, and they added an alt tab or super tab window switching feature as well. Display mirroring is now supported. The panel now has an overflow section when there are too many applications or applets in there. They fixed a lot of bugs related to gaming and a few performance issues as well. And their compositor is now multi-threaded, so it should perform better with multi-monitor setups and when using high refresh rates. And they also apparently have a bunch of third-party contributions landing in Cosmic, which bodes well for the future of this desktop. If there are already people contributing, improving it, and creating third-party applications, even before Cosmic is out, I think it's a good sign. I will start toying with Cosmic before the alpha is out, just to, like, maybe prepare the video I'm gonna make about it. Of course, it won't be a full review because it is an alpha, there are going to be bugs. I will only judge the features that are available and how well I think they measure up compared to other desktops. Now, speaking of desktops, GNOME 47 has a lot of stuff coming on top of accent colors and a bunch of things I already discussed in previous episodes. First, the default font will very likely be replaced by Inter. Gnome has been using the Cantarell font for about 14 years, although some distros already replaced it, like Ubuntu, for example. The issue is Cantarell is unmaintained, which for a font is more problematic than you'd think, because it means potential problems in different languages can be reported and they just won't be fixed. Inter, on the other hand, is maintained and already used in elementary OS and other projects. It's also completely open source, so that's nice. And also it's the font I've been using in GNOME and KDE for I think the past four years. It's really nice. So the change is undergoing testing and it might not be voted on in the end if issues arise. They are also experimenting with the font size they should use with Inter. GNOME 47 will also have some HDR related improvements. They already have an experimental HDR property that lets you test a few modes, but as far as I know, this hasn't really evolved since GNOME 44. In GNOME 47, they have merged a seven-month-old merge request, which lets Mutter, the GNOME compositor, just display HDR and SDR content side by side. On top of that, they have completed the implementation of Nautilus as the file chooser. The implementation of the global keyboard shortcuts feature is moving along nicely, with a first draft implementation for libportal. The notification portal spec is being implemented as we speak, with a first merge request close to completion, and there's a proposal to have a common interface for platform libraries, like Advaita or Granite from Elementary OS, so any desktop could plug into GTK with their own widget library. That is a pretty big set of changes for GNOME 47 and also a pretty big set of changes lined up for the future versions as well. This is not going to be like GNOME 45 or 46 where there were just very minor features. This one is going to be big and of course I'll cover it in a video. I think it will be in September when it releases. Now we have some news in the ongoing lawsuits against AI tools, at least in the US. GitHub and Microsoft had been sued over GitHub Copilot and its use of open source code to train the assistant. A judge in San Francisco dismissed part of this class action lawsuit because the plaintiffs apparently failed to establish that Microsoft unjustly enriched themselves by using their code. And thus, these developers are not eligible for damages on that specific basis. But there's another part that will be allowed to proceed. The claim that GitHub Copilot breaches the open source licenses of the code it used, which might in the end be the more important part. This can now go to court, meaning that there is a chance that AI tools might have to follow attribution and licensing rights even for just using material to train the AI. This could potentially result in all the codes generated by these tools to be made open source under a license or another. Or maybe people who use codes generated using Copilot would have to include in their project a link to an insanely long list of acknowledgements to mention everyone whose code Copilot used to train itself. None of this would be very practical though. 
And I, for one, I'm really glad that this part of the lawsuit wasn't just dismissed out of hand, because we need to know if an AI using publicly available material has the rights to do so to train itself, or if it has to follow and respect all the licenses attached to this content. This is a very important part of whether AI can keep existing as it is or needs to start paying people for their content. So I hope this goes to court. I hope this is a ruling in favor of creators and not AI developers, but we'll see. I don't know, I don't make the rules. Now, as the EU forced Apple to open iOS to third-party stores, it looks like they're not going down without a fight. Epic Games have been trying to put their App Store on iOS for a while now, but it looks like Apple found some weird ways to reject the app, the latest being because the install button on the Epic Games Store was too similar to the one from the Apple Store, which, well, how many ways are there to create a flat-colored button with the install text written on it, really, apart from changing the color? Now, the in-app purchases button was also apparently too similar. Fortunately, after Epic complained publicly, Apple decided to let the store pass anyway, probably because they're already under fire from the EU for the various limitations and terms of services for the apps that want to escape the App Store, with a fee structure that is completely insane. They probably decided it wasn't worth fighting something that was going to happen anyway. And then Tim Sweeney, the CEO of Epic Games, said that Apple told them that this approval of their Epic Store was only temporary and that they would still have to change these buttons in their next update. And if you've watched the channel for a while, you know I'm not a big fan of Epic Games because while they profess being on the side of the customer, they apply restrictions to customer choice by signing exclusivity deals, which is exactly the kind of stuff that they say is bad when it comes from other actors. So they're pretty hypocritical about all of this. But Apple really needs to stop with this kind of trying to grasp at the last straws of their control. It doesn't work. They've lost this battle. Unless Epic Games absolutely copies the entire design of an app listing of the App Store, which, yes, would be misleading and would not be a good thing, it's an install button. Let people make an install button that looks like what your platform professes and your platform guidelines. You've lost the battle, Apple. Stop it. It's done. Okay, let's finish this with the gaming news. First, DXVK got a new update, version 2.4, and it now brings in support for DirectX 8. This means that this translation layer now handles DirectX 8, 9, 10, and 11 games, with DirectX 12 games being handled by VKD3D or VKD3D Proton. The net benefit is that you're now using Vulkan to render these games, instead of using the usual Wine D3D backend, which, as far as I know, used OpenGL and had way worse compatibility and performance. The XVK now includes the ability to automatically cap a game's FPS to the refresh rate of your display to make sure that things are rendered smoothly, and they also improved the XVK native, which is a port of the XVK that lets developers use it without using Wine so they can port the games to Linux more easily without having to rewrite, for example, the DirectX rendering backend. They just have to compile the executable for Linux and they can keep using the DirectX backend because DXVK will translate it properly. There are also some improvements to memory usage, improvement to AMD GPU support, and some game-specific fixes, notably for Guild Wars 2, Prototype, Star Citizen, and more. So basically, it's much better performance for older DirectX 8 titles, but it's also better performance for relatively recent games, because most games released today still kind of have a DirectX 11 backend, because not every GPU supports DirectX 12 fully even now. We also have a new version of Bottles, the app that lets you automatically create prefixes for Wine and running Windows programs on Linux. In this version, they added support for the latest version of DXVK that I just talked about. They also improved performance of the entire app through better handling of the virtual C drive that Bottles creates for each program. And you will also get an option to skip the checksum verification process if you want to install things faster at the expense of security. Menu entries for programs installed with Bottles should also only appear when the executable is actually available which should help with cleaning up when you're removing programs to avoid having leftover launchers that will clutter your menu and don't have anything to launch. 
And Valve is also refining their game recording feature in the latest Steam beta. The clip editing feature has been improved to make it easier to play something back, to add markers to the timeline, and to decide where the clip begins and where it ends. You will also be able to save a specific frame of a clip as a Steam screenshot, and you will now get a warning if game recording was turned off to prioritize broadcasting. The minimum background recording time has also been increased to 15 minutes. This feature is apparently still not hardware accelerated when using an NVIDIA GPU, which probably makes the solution less appealing than using OBS for NVIDIA users, but it is shaping up nicely for everyone else. If you had given me this feature three years ago, back when I tried running a Linux gaming channel, I would have been very, very happy. Now, granted, this channel is now dead and no one ever really watched it, but I would have loved having access to that kind of stuff back in the day. Just like you love having access to devices from our sponsor. Tuxedo Computers, they make devices that run with Linux out of the box, from laptops to workstations to gaming stuff to small form factor computers, they have everything. All the devices have plenty of options for the hardware, for the keyboard layout, for the logo on the lid of your computer, and they ship to most countries in the world. All their stuff obviously is highly compatible with Linux because that's kind of the point and while you can pick from a selection of popular distros, you can also just install any distro you like and they even have repos to include certain patches that might not have been accepted upstream just yet. I only use Tuxedo computers these days, I run this channel on one of their laptops, I do all my gaming on one of their desktops, they're really really good so click the link in the description below if you want to know what they have to offer and if you want to give them a shot. Okay, so thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications. And if you really enjoy the channel, you can get plenty of perks by supporting it starting at one euro a month. And all the links are in the description just as well. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.